I need you to talk to my son, Ryan. I said, well, what's wrong with Ryan? Ryan was 12. She said, I need you to talk to Ryan. I said, well, what's going on with Ryan? She said, well, you know, his dad, his, his job sent him away. He's going to be gone for two months. And so I had his dad talk to him about this, but I walked by the bathroom and Ryan was in the bathroom mirror with his shirt off, just going like this. <laughs> and she said, I, is that normal? I was a little bit embarrassed, but I said, yeah, I still do that. <laughs> What was Ryan measuring? We look growth, right? We measure all this growth. We measure our growth in every way we can. We measure the growth of our hair. And even as we get older, we start measuring the growth of other parts of us. Maybe some of us don't have to get too old to measure that, but. We continue to measure our own growth throughout life. And isn't it incredible? How down and how upset we can get when growth seems to fail. When our growth is tested and we don't quite measure up. When I'm intellectually supposed to have grown so much and know so much and I didn't remember or know the thing I was supposed to know. Or physically, I was supposed to get so strong and so fast, and I know I can do this thing. And I'm out of the field or the court. And the little guy got the better of me. The slow guy beat me. Or when I'm supposed to be so emotionally and, and you know, intellectually strong and grown and have grown beyond my peers and I find myself just wanting to cry. It's incredible how we perceive these lack of these moments of lack of growth to be so devastating. And you heard me make the joke and all these people like grown as I said it, right? Like, I'm the least talented man at the seminary. I am not saying that to make people feel bad. I am saying that because it's true these guys are incredible. I mean, I just want to point out that we've never done this together. Ever. We didn't even practice this. Those guys are making me look great. I look like a genius right now. And I spent the first couple years of school, right? Now this was really bad, right? So the first couple years of school at seminary, I'd walk into every class, I'd throw my arms in the air and say, okay, the dumb guy has arrived. Teachers, please teach me. Because I recognized that I didn't meet up to the level of growth that my peers had. And I'll tell you that I'd never be here, I'd never be a deacon if I had quit in front of myself. More importantly, I'd never want to become a deacon if I had believed that God had put on me. And that's really the point of tonight, that God does not quit on you or me. That no matter how you and I measure our own growth, that is not how our Lord sees us, and that's not how our Lord measures us. God doesn't look at you and notice all of your failures and measure them up and say, well, 52 failures today succeeded once. He doesn't tally us up that way. God doesn't look at you and say, well, I gave him the ability to be smarter than everyone else and, well, totally failed that test. Matter of fact, the dumb guy did better. He doesn't look at us that way. It's a funny thing. The other day I was a deacon at, the, at Mass at the seminary. Totally messed up as a deacon at Mass. You know the problem with being a deacon at Mass? Everyone 
watches everything you do. You know the problem of being a deacon at Mass at the seminary? They all know if you do something wrong. <laughs> you know the other problem that's worse than that? They're all happy to tell you what you did that was wrong. If I had given up my, on myself the first two years, I never would have got to the point where guys could make fun of me for having messed up the other day. <laughs> and it's huge because the reality is that God looks at us and the way he measures you, the way he measures me, there is a measuring stick. Does anybody know what that measure is? You know what? I'll shut up right now. I'll see. You guys had the chance to silence me. Uh, I'm going to talk for now. Kidding. He measures you by his love for you. He measures me by his love for me. It's the very same love that had him come from heaven, take on flesh, have a human heart, and dwell in a manger. It's the same love that had him take bread and wine and say, this is my body, I'll never, ever, ever leave you. It's the same love that had him say, I'll take the cross so that you can be in heaven with me because I'd rather die than face eternity without you. That's the love that he measures you and I would buy. It's by that. And that love overcomes our own failures. It overcomes our own messing up. It overcomes our own like, thoughts of how we're not good enough or perfect enough or how we haven't grown to a certain level. It overwhelms all of that because God loves you. So much so that at the drop of a hat, you'll come and dwell on this altar just that you and I would spend a few minutes with him. That's how we're measured. And if God who measures us that way, then can and will change everything out of love for us. I know it's been a really weird couple of years. COVID is just like, whoa. I know sometimes it feels like this might never end. But the reality is that it's the same Jesus who healed people that sits at this altar today. It's the same Jesus who walked on water that sits on this altar today. It's the same Jesus who controlled the weather who will sit on this altar tonight. And there isn't anything that he does not want to be present in and with and for. Everything changes when Jesus is in the room. Now I'm going to be honest. The heartbreaking thing is sometimes we pray for things and we ask God to do things and they don't happen. Well, the reality is that he's actually God and not like a genie. Right? Like a genie, you say genie do this and he does it. That's why genies don't really exist. But with God, he's present. And things will change, but not always the way we want them. Things will happen, but not always the way we want. But even in the things that aren't good, He'll be present. And He'll make good things come out of them. He'll always make something good come out of it. He'll never feel like that. He'll always, always, always do it. But we have to go to him. We have to be with him. When we're with Jesus, everything is possible. All growth is possible. All change is possible. 
Sometimes the hardest growth and change for me is really just to recognize that getting everything the way I would like probably isn't the best thing for everyone in the world. I just played the lottery. Do you think Jesus is going to actually give it to me? And I'm like, I'm going to be a priest. I'm a deacon. Do you know all the cool things I can do with this? I can end all the poverty in Chicago. Jesus, just give me all the money. Sounds great. What would I probably do? Probably take these guys and take a trip. I'd call him off Elon Musk and we'd be the first seminarians in space or something. Right? Like, something stupid. But cool. He doesn't always give us exactly what we want, but he'll make something good happen in anything that ever happens. He'll bring good out of it. Because everything changes. He's the God of the universe who created reality. He's reality himself. And so the only one who can change or affect reality is that same author, right? That's why the cross is incredible. Because with the death and resurrection of Jesus, God says, not even death has the last word over you. The worst thing that could happen would be that you would die, and there would be no relationship with any person or with God. And Jesus says, not even true. Death might take you, and I'll take you back from death. I'll bring you in heaven so that you have a relationship with me, with everyone in heaven, and everyone on earth. I'll make you a state. We'll give you a new title. All things can change with that. The question for you and me is, where do we need Jesus tonight? Where in our lives, where in our hearts, when are in our experiences do we need Jesus tonight? Because he's going to be here. He's going to be present for you and me, and he wants to be present in that. And for some of those things, he may change them, and for others, he may make something good come out of them. If only we'll go to him. The God of the universe. When he walks into this room, everything changes.
No 
music. And during this time, we are all continually on the city of fire. The goal is really just to be comfortable praying and with Jesus. So you have full freedom now. Sit, stand, kneel, whatever you have to do.
It's who you are, it's who you are, and loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most sacred heart. 
Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. Blessed be God in His angels.
had a chance to meet Dominic. Dominic is the new seminarian for, for St. Mary's. And so I was lucky to be here for the last, well, current five years. We have Dominic this year. He'll be ordained a, a, a deacon this coming summer. And you'll have him one more year before he's ordained a priest. So please, please, please pray for Dominic because big things are coming. Um, so big thank you to Dominic as well. Of course, you, know, you have to say a big thank you to Father Dan and for Terry for putting this all on. Uh, you know, this was kind of their idea to make this happen and allow us to have all the resources and make everything work so that we can start the year off with something that's incredible. Um, so thank you both for your incredible time, gift, um, patience, and creativity to make this happen. Um, well, that's all I really have for you. I want to ask you to do one super special thing for me before you leave. You can leave any time, but you have to do one thing before you can leave. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but at the moment that Deacon Dan lifted that giant monster up, right, like he was Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, he had his hands covered, right? And that covering symbolizes that it's not him giving a blessing, but Jesus himself blessing us. That was a blessing. We received a blessing. And Jesus blesses us so that we can be a blessing. Very often, I find in my own life that God makes a terrible thing a great thing and uses another person as a way of making it happen. So tonight, I'm going to ask you, whenever you leave, before you leave, you have to bless someone. Right? Whether that mean you whisper in their ear, God bless you. Whether that mean you trace the sign of the cross on their forehead, right? I'm Puerto Rican. I was never allowed to leave my house before a family member traced the sign of the cross on my head. If I tried, they would beat me, make me come back home, <laughs> right? Sign of the cross, and then I could leave, bloody. Uh, no, they didn't beat me. But whether that be a sign of the cross, put a blessing in some way, okay? Um, Kids, you know, your parents are here. It's a great time to give them $100. Um, parents, your kids are here in front of Jesus. It's a great time to ask them. Don't ask them. Um, but, so before you leave, Pete, please offer someone a blessing because Jesus blessed you tonight so that you can be that blessing. Thank you.